All right, welcome back. Um, so in case you're just joining, just now joining us, welcome to Hear Me, See Me, day two of the 2021 Equity in Missouri Higher Education Summit. If you are just now joining us, I am Sarah Sammons, co-planner of the summit and today's MC. In just a few minutes, we'll hear from our keynote speaker, Dr. Sarah Pingle. Before we get started, I have a few conference etiquette reminders. All participants should stay muted to eliminate background noise. We want to see your faces, so if you have a camera, please turn it on to better engage with us. All presentations will be live, so bear with us if, on any technical issues. The chat will be monitored for questions throughout the presentations, so if you have any questions for Dr. Pingle as we go along, please enter them in the chat. Later on in the, in the summit, if you enter a session and decide it's not for you, please close and head to a different session just like you would at an in-person conference. All sessions will be recorded, so you will be able to access them after the conference. And don't forget to engage with us on social media throughout the day using hashtag equity 2021 at ModeDude and our new conference website, Edge Events. And speaking of that, I would be remiss if I did not also um, take this moment to thank MOCAN, the Missouri College Access Network, for sponsoring our department's new conference landing website, edgeevents.dude.mo.gov. MOCAN's mission is to increase college and career readiness, preparation, access, and completion in Missouri, particularly for the underrepresented and underserved students, and aligns with, wonderfully with the work that our department is doing, and we appreciate all of their support. So, let me go ahead and introduce our keynote speaker this morning, Dr. Sarah Pingle. Dr. Sarah Pingle supports the research and analytical capacity of the policy team in her role as principal at Education Commission of the States. She is a skilled presenter and facilitator on a variety of education topics, but especially issues of post-secondary finance and college affordability. She can be often found behind a spreadsheet or with her nose in state statutes. She's my kind of gal. Um, Dr. Pingle is passionate about supporting education leaders in their roles as decision makers and supporters of students across the educational spectrum. Please join me in extending a warm Missouri welcome to Dr. Sarah Pingle. Thanks so much for that welcome, Sarah, and I will try to, to live up to the the bio that just preceded me. Um, so glad to be with you all today. Welcome to my guest room. Um, just glad to, to be here in this conference with all of you today. Certainly wish we could be in person. And, um, you know, we're, we're doing our best as we always do. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen um, and get into presentation mode. So that's that working well for everyone. Some thumbs up. Great. Um, Great. So Sarah mentioned that um, I am from the Education Commission of the States. If you have not heard of ECS, um, we are a national education policy organization that has been serving state policymakers in all 50 states in the District of Columbia for nearly 60 years. We're nonpartisan, unbiased, and cover the full spectrum of education issues from early learning through post-secondary and through workforce development. We really think of ourselves as part of state education policy teams. Um, we believe that states have a lot to learn from one another and that there's a lot of power in learning from experience. And we think that informed policymakers um, um, can create better education policy. And so that's really where we, where we like to shine, right, is in providing that information to inform the decision-making process. We do this in a few different ways. We do it through um, writing research reports. So you'll, um, you may have um, seen in the past some of ECS's 50 state comparisons where we'll take a particular policy question and compare it across all 50 states. Um, we write reports analyzing some of that data and information. We host multiple convenings per year of state legislators, governor's offices, um, folks um, in decision-making capacity for higher ed and for other sectors of education. And then we also provide one on one confidential counsel to states as well, um, either in memos or in um, meetings, different things of that nature. So um, today, what I would really like to share with this group um, is research that we've done around state financial aid programs. And the message that I really want to leave 
everyone with today is that financial aid really matters in states equity efforts. And that might seem like, okay, yeah, of course it does because affordability is an issue. Sam and Eric just highlighted, especially how much of an issue it is in the state of Missouri. Um, but I think that states have a key role to play when it comes to their financial aid programs and the power that those programs hold to help make, um, to help improve equity within their states, right? To help make sure that um, opportunity in higher ed is available to all students, sure, but especially to students that are black, Hispanic, students of color, um, indigenous students, students from low income, students from rural areas, financial aid programs hold um, a lot of power in helping to make affordability issues less prevalent for students from these populations, especially. So I'm gonna to try to leave you with a few facts today about state financial aid to try to give you a few, um, a few pieces in your toolkit, right? As you start to think about, you know, what are the, the what are the reforms or what are the changes that we may start to, to think about in Missouri to make sure that financial aid is living up to its promise of really being a, a engine for equity within the state. First, state financial aid has actually increased across all of the states over the last two decades, unlike the rest of state support. So you may hear a lot, oh my gosh, like states aren't keeping their part of the bargain, you know, the three-legged stool metaphor that a lot of folks use, the stool is falling over because there's no state support coming into institutions anymore, the state support has been so reduced that it's not enough, it's not effective anymore. Um, and I think it's really important for folks to remember that, yeah, that's, that's true in a lot of states. State support has declined, but what hasn't declined is state financial aid in most states. Um, so it's really kind of this shift of um, support from the state, not necessarily going through general appropriations anymore, right? So just general campus operating, that kind of that black box, whatever that looks like but really going through students and letting students kind of march with their feet to the campus where they want to attend within the state where they could take their state financial aid dollars. Um, and state's financial aid has been more protected from cuts than general appropriations to campuses, right? And I think there's a few different reasons for that, right? Like legislators don't wanna cut support that their constituents are getting for this experience that, you know, Sam and Eric highlighted is just increasingly unaffordable for many families. Um, so just something to keep in mind, right, that state financial aid is actually increasing across the states, not decreasing the way the rest of state support is. And it's increasing to the tune of over $12 billion per year, and state aid serves over 4.5 million students across the country. So $12 billion may seem like a lot. Of course, it's small compared to federal, the Pell Grant program or federal student loans and different things like that. But it's enough money to care, I would say, and it's enough money that could really impact um, students' affordability decisions and their decisions about whether and how to attend post-secondary education. Um, and on a per-student basis, these awards are usually pretty significant, right? So we're not talking, you know, two, five hundred dollars. They're usually a couple thousand dollars that students are receiving a year um that can really support their success in post-secondary education, whether it's defraying some of that tuition expense or whether in some states that aid is creating a refund that they could then use for living expenses or textbooks or different things like that, this aid can have a really big impact for students that are receiving it. As with any state program that receives money, it's also often the object of legislation. Um, and so this map shows all the states that are in purple are states that have considered at least one bill related to their state financial aid program or programs in the last legislative session. So every, nearly every state in most sessions consider at least one bill related to their program, whether that's a program that already exists that, that folks might be seeking to reform or introducing or beginning a new program, starting something different, um, there's always, it seems like there's always something, and it's usually anywhere from just one bill in some states to pushing 40 bills in other states. Um, so it's rare that um, financial aid programs aren't the object of legislative attention and gubernatorial attention too, for that matter. However, what we see across the country is that most of those bills don't pass. So many of them, this is all of the total sum of bills from the last legislative session, they remain in introduced status. That means that they never receive a hearing, they never really make it to committee, the, the chair never really 
schedules it for anything. Fewer pass through the first and second chambers, um, and far fewer than that, so only about a quarter of, um, of the bills that were introduced in the last session were actually enacted, made it to the governor's desk, got a signature. Um, and this is for a lot of reasons, right? I think because finance, because college affordability is such you know, a big capital C, capital A college affordability issue right now, um, there's a lot of folks with ideas about how to make it better, right? And so those folks with the power to introduce legislation are going to do that. And far fewer of those ideas, and this isn't just unique to financial aid, right? This could be true of preschool or of any other kind of education issue or health or any other public policy issue. Far fewer of those bills make it um, to the governor's desk. So the ones that do usually have pretty strong legislative champions, they have support of the right people, and especially in financial aid programs, they have um, the cost and the, the fiscal no support behind them as well. So just a little bit of kind of under the hood of where those bills kind of stand and where they move. Across all of the bills related to state financial aid programs that we tracked in the last year, um, there are three really big trends. And I think that these trends um, have been somewhat prevalent in Missouri too. The first one by far is workforce development. So state legislators are across the bills that we read related to state financial aid programs. And I should have mentioned it's all of the bills related to state financial aid programs that we read. So we're not kind of picking from here and there. We, our team literally, and I'm, when I say our team, I really mean me because this is like my passionate issue. Um, we read them all across all 50 states. And workforce development is really the most prevalent trend that we're seeing right now. So, um, Legislatively, states seem to have a pretty significant appetite for linking college affordability efforts to how, um, how students will complete college and then how they will interact with the workforce after graduation. So we're seeing more and more programs that are tailored down only to perhaps a certain subset of academic majors or academic areas, um, usually linked to a list that isn't specified in statute, but gives the authority to perhaps a workforce development board or a state SHEO agency, someone like the Missouri Department of Higher Ed and Workforce Development to develop a list and to update that list regularly. So not only, and this is kind of a new ask of a lot of institutional aid offices, if I have any institutional level folks in here, not only are you having to monitor does this student qualify based on their academic major, but is that academic major going to remain one of those in need fields over the years? Um, so those kinds of linkages between specific fields that are deemed kind of in need for states is huge right now. Another trend across all of the state financial aid legislation that we read last year is COVID-19 response. So for um, a need-based program that might look like adjusting deadlines to get the FAFSA in, knowing that, that that's been a little bit more difficult for students and families over the last couple of years. Um, for merit-based programs, it might look like relaxing testing requirements because it's been difficult for students to access testing sites, testing centers, testing dates to, to get SAT and ACT scores. Um, but anything that has to do with relaxing requirements so that students during this time of COVID-19 could actually like feasibly become eligible for the program has been key. Um, and then finally, we're seeing still a lot of free college bills. Now, we define free college pretty broadly at Education Commission of the States. I include a bill as a free college bill if it um, calculates a last dollar award amount. So if any kind of scholarship that's going to cover um, the last bit of tuition and fees. And this is really the most popular way right now to calculate award amount is doing this, um, this free college amount. So this last dollar of tuition and fees to ensure affordability. There are far fewer state programs that award on a first dollar basis or any kind of um, entitlement basis, if that makes sense. Um, and it's still, what, 8.15 in the morning. So I'm gonna take a sip of coffee really quick. We were earlier in mountain time. I should have mentioned that ECS is based in Denver. So I'm a little bit behind you guys this morning in my coffee intake. Um, so a couple more facts I wanna leave you with around state financial aid programs. So not only do states invest a lot of money and do a lot of, do a lot of legislation, but introduce a lot of legislation around the topic. And not only are they focused on these three main topics of workforce development, COVID-19 response and free college, um, state financial aid programs are also usually based on financial need. 
Um, and so states generally at times can get a lot of flack for um, for merit based awarding and I something you know as I work in DC circles that I'm generally um, working against is this narrative that states only award aid based on merit and it's actually just really not true the data don't bear it out most state aid programs are awarded based on financial need and most state financial aid programs provide the most support to students at four year public institutions. Um, if we were in person, this is one of my favorite kind of call out to the crowd questions. What do you, so just, I guess, think to yourself or maybe pop it in the chat. Um, the, le the next greatest group, so after four year public institutions, which sector of higher ed across the country do you think receives the most support from state financial aid programs? And I can't see the chat right now in presentation mode. So if someone wants to have the, the courage to call out and unmute and let me know what might be appearing in the chat box. That would be really helpful. Um, I can call, excuse me, call out. So people are guessing community colleges. And that's usually what people guess, but it's not. It is four year private institutions. So across the country, the most dollars are funneling to four year public institutions and then to four year private institutions with two year public institutions trailing behind that. And in some states, and um, since we're doing a one state presentation, I'll call them out, it's Iowa, um, state financial aid actually only goes to four-year private institutions. So a lot of state aid programs were predicated on this idea of equalization, right? People should have choice. They should be able to pick whatever institution they wanna to go to. And so we should provide state aid to equalize tuition between the private and the public sector. And the vestiges of that, the residue from that policy idea still remains today in the way that state financial aid programs are dispersed. And I don't have to tell this crowd that that has very clear equity implications. Not to say that four-year private institutions can't serve students of color well, but we do know based on enrollment trends that many low-income students, students from rural backgrounds, black students, Hispanic students, students are more likely to enroll into a two-year public institution and they're less likely to take a, finance, a state financial aid award with them to that institution than a student with um, a different background in a four-year private institution. So what I was going to pop up with just a little bit of data, um, you know, Sarah mentioned at the top that I like to put my nose in the spreadsheet and I hope that I'm in good company here. Um, a little bit of data to illustrate these points, right? So usually based on needs. So in the gray bars, um, are, can I get a couple of nods that we're seeing the graph or no? No. Oh, goodness gracious, because I shared PowerPoint. Um, let me see if I can switch that. You'll bear with me for just a second. One of the researchers on our team spent um, a good bit of time putting this together. And so I would be remiss if I did not spend 30 seconds right now switching the screen share so that y'all could see this fabulous data. Um, is that better for folks? We can see it. Perfect. Thank you so much, Sarah. So the gray bars show merit-based dollars dispersed. This is all in constant 2021 dollars across all of the states. So this isn't just Missouri. This is all 50 states in DC and Puerto Rico put together. And the purple bars show the need-based dollars dispersed. So you can see that, yeah, merit-based disbursements are rising across the states, but they're certainly not eclipsing or close to what states are investing in need-based programs. And then the next data point I wanted to illustrate to support the point around need-based dollars is by sector. So this is the orange bars is two-year in-state public institutions and how much need-based aid they receive from states every year. And then again, this is all 50 states, DC, Puerto Rico, everyone together, this isn't just Missouri. And then the amount of aid that students receive in four-year in-state public institutions. Um, a graph like this is usually justified by the fact that tuition is more expensive in four-year public institutions, and that's why there's more money flowing to those institutions, right? The students in four-year public institutions just need more support than students in two-year private, two-year public institutions. Um, and because most state aid programs only cover the cost of tuition and fees and don't provide any kind of cost of living refund or anything like that, like, yeah, okay, it's true, the tuition is usually higher. But what I think further drives this point home is that um, the recipient counts don't add up, right? And so if that were true, that students at two years, if that were true, it's a big capital IF, if that were true, that students in two-year public institutions need less support than students in um, four-year public institutions, you would expect to see the recipient count be higher, right? So we're still serving more students, just as many students in the two-year public sector than we are in the four-year public sector. 
but the data don't bear that either at all either right so most students across the country um, that are receiving state aid do so in um, in a four-year public institution so it's not just the money it's also the student count so let me pop back over to my slideshow here so where does that kind of leave us so I'll wind down the presentation with, okay, so we've pointed out all these equity issues within state financial aid programs. The programs really matter. They, they cost states a good bit of money. They serve a lot of students, but they have these equity implications of, of merit-based aid and not, not equitably awarding by sector in the two-year public sector especially. What, what should states do, right? Where should we leave states? So what we like to um, leave state policymakers with are really principles to guide their policymaking in this area. Um, as a nonpartisan organization, we would never tell a state, you know, you need to do this or you need to do that. No one elected me to office, fortunately, because who knows what kind of <laughs> shambles your state would be in if that were true. That job is hard. And I don't pretend to say that I could do it any better than the, than the folks that do have the courage to fill those seats. Um, but we like to leave state leaders with some, um, some principles to at least be able to say like, okay, someone's proposed this bill. I have to vote on this bill. Do I think that this bill stacks up to some values that I'm aligned with when it comes to what state financial aid programs should or could be doing? Does this idea that this constituent has brought to my office or this university president has brought to my office hold water for me? And what kind of lens could I use to kind of figure that out? And so that's really how we use our principles to guide state aid policymaking. Um, this wasn't just Sarah Pingle in her office deciding like, oh, what are some good ideas for this, right? This was the collective work of a group of folks that at ECS we convene regularly called thinkers. So, this was folks that are um, intimately involved in state aid policy um, and practice and some experts in the field that we've brought together to um, really take a blank sheet approach and say, you know, if I were a legislator and if I were considering reform in state financial aid, what should those reforms look like? Um, and we've done that twice at this point. So we've convened two different groups to see if these, if these principles hold water and we've had some good success so far, but certainly open to feedback on that point. So the first principle is that state financial aid programs should be student centered. That means that we believe aid programs should be designed around students and their needs. And that when you do this, you set students up for the most successful outcomes. So what could this look like in practice? We use an example um, from the state of California where they do require a high school GPA for one of their programs eligibility requirements. And they used to require students to turn into their state financial aid agency a high school transcript to verify that GPA. Um, and that just puts more onus on the students to turn more things in. It puts more onus on the California State, um, the California Student Aid Commission to receive and process those transcripts, right? Um, and so a student-centered reform that they've made recently is just to automatically share that data between K-12 stakeholders, between high schools, and the Aid Commission. We think this is a really good example of a student-centered reform because it takes, it, it's designed around what the student needs, right? Like the student doesn't need to be between two different state agencies that are trying to determine whether or not they're eligible for this program. State agencies can work to streamline some of this. Of course, there's a million other examples of student-centered reforms, um, but making sure that the design of the program and especially the design of the eligibility pathway centers the student really matters a lot. The second principle is that state aid programs should be goal-driven and data-informed. And if you were to ask, you know, even in, within the state of Missouri, what are our state financial aid programs trying to achieve? What kind of education or workforce goals are we trying to achieve? I'm curious how many different answers you would get, right? And that's true in all 50 states. That's not just Missouri, right? If you were to go to Texas or to Colorado or to Illinois and ask the same question, how many different answers would you get? And so it's rare that we see states enact financial aid programs that have clearly defined and easily understood intent that is aligned with measurable education and workforce goals. This sounds like, oh yeah, of course, states should be doing that. And the fact is that most states don't. It's difficult to do. It's difficult to, um, to get stakeholders at the table and to really harness and obtain that, um, oh, what is the word I'm looking for? 
um, agreement on on what the goals are and how the state programs are going to move towards them. And it's also just hard to measure, you know, for, so for some of the data wonks in the room, you know, how do you measure student outcomes that make sense for for all students, not just for students from maybe a four year public program or from a nursing program versus a welding program versus, you know, I always use myself, my bachelor's degree is in French, right? Like, how do you measure that outcome for where I am right now? It's tough stuff. So sounds easy, really tough in practice. Principle three, timely and flexible. So we really believe that financial aid programs should provide financial support, support to students when it can have the greatest impact on their enrollment and persistence decisions. So one of the things that states that have done this type of analysis usually wring their hands about is, oh gosh, like do we know that our aid program is supporting students choice to enroll? Would they have enrolled if not for the aid program? Are they making the decision to persist from year to year or to persist all the way to the graduation podium because we're providing the support or would they be doing that anyway? Would we be better spending our money on different students where it could impact a decision? And gosh, those are really difficult questions to answer and especially with the data systems that most states have, it's sometimes really just impossible to answer. But being thoughtful about deadlines for your program and when students know whether or not they're gonna qualify for the aid we certainly don't think it can hurt, right? And so if you're in a, in a decision-making time frame in maybe the spring of your senior year, um, make sure that those students know whether or not they would get aid before the fall, right? Or if you're working with an adult student population, having really clear eligibility criteria so that students can be able to say like, oh yeah, you know, with some level of certainty, I could probably rely on receiving this $2,000 from the state. And so that'll help me bring down that cost in these ways. Um, can be really powerful in helping students to make decisions. Um, and we also believe that flexibility is key. And flexibility is hard for states to achieve because there's usually an appropriation for a need program that you're trying to back into rather than you're providing, you know, here's the, the full universe of need that we have legislature, please fund this. That's rare. That usually doesn't happen. You usually receive money and then you have to figure out how to how to spend it on more students than um, than you um, have money to fund, right? But we believe that that flexibility is key. So whether that's providing flexible deadlines for the FAFSA, if you have to have a deadline, um, or providing multiple deadlines. So a good example of this is the state of Oregon. They are one of those states, like most states, that's in a position to have to ration their appropriation to fit the number of students that they can fund rather than funding all students that qualify. They've moved to a more of a rolling deadline throughout the summer. So rather than one really high stakes deadline on usually March 1st, um, could we have multiple throughout the summer so that students um, have more time to decide if they want to apply and, and what type of aid they'd like to receive. And I promise you there's only four principles. So we've done three out of four, only one more to go. The fourth principle is broadly inclusive. So we believe that financial aid programs should be broadly inclusive of all students' educational pathways and responding to the diverse enrollment options available to students today. And we conceived of this principle before COVID, and I think that it's rapidly rising to one of the most important ones, right? So if a student is in a distance ed program, if they're choosing to do some of their coursework remotely, if they might be availing themselves of options to do um, tests to get out of certain class club tests or things like that, if they're putting together a portfolio, if they're doing some sort of competency-based assessments, those experiences aren't free. <laughs> And in most states, um, students can't necessarily use their aid to cover them. Um, and so we've been seeing a lot of states make reforms in this area, especially due to the increasing prevalence of, um, of distance ed. And there's likely more work to do on this one, especially when it comes to some other more non-traditional ways of delivering credit to students. So really quickly at the end, I just want to leave you with a little bit of what's next. What could be next for states when it comes to state aid? We're watching FAFSA simplification efforts at the federal level really closely, especially when it comes to selective service registration and students with drug convictions. We think that both of these um, efforts have really clear equity implications in states for students that may not fall on the strict gender binary, right, with their selective service registration. When I was an aid administrator, that was a tough question for a lot of students. Um, and so um, the removal of that question at the federal level is a, a great reform. The removal of the question at the federal level around students with drug convictions no longer being precluded from receiving federal aid is key. 
And there are many state programs that still have these requirements and statutes for state aid eligibility. So the degree to which states will remove those eligibility requirements from their programs really matters for a lot of reasons, not only for the equity implications of selective service registration and awarding to students with previous drug convictions, but for simplicity in applying for all students. So if these requirements aren't removed also from state aid programs, additional application barriers could crop up at the state level for verifying these requirements. We're also closely watching how states are going to be implementing the new student aid index. So super wonky, but if you if you like me, you know, really enjoy reading the Federal Register, <laughs> you may have seen that the, the estimated family contribution is being replaced with this new student aid index and not and it will get rid of some of that artificial bunching we had around the zero EFC because it will be able to go negative now. And so states are going to have different ways to delineate between levels of need in a group that used to just be one big monolith of zero EFCs and watching how states confront that and how they meet those greater levels of need is a really key thing that we're watching. We're also answering a lot of questions from states around high school graduation requirements and if filling out the FAFSA should be a high school graduation requirement. We also see a lot of really clear equity implications in imposing additional high school graduation requirements on folks especially for students with undocumented immigration status or for students that may have been or are in the foster care program. Um, and so it's something we're watching really carefully to make sure that states are thinking about, okay, if you're gonna go down this path of adding the requirement, you need to make sure that you're thinking about students who just for whatever reason won't be able to, to meet that requirement. So that is where I will leave you. I know I went a little bit over where I wanted to go today in terms of time, but please do feel free to email me with any questions, comments, concerns. You can find me on Twitter at Sarah underscore Pingle as well. Um, gosh, I need a new headshot. You ever look at your headshot and you're just like, geez, this isn't working for me anymore, but you know, live and learn. Um, feel free to shoot me an email. And if we do have any time today, um, I'm happy to answer any questions as well that we may have had in the, in the chat. Well, thank you so much, Sarah. Um, this has been a very informative and um, wonderful opportunity to hear from you. So we do have some questions. So uh, we'll go ahead and get started. So the first question is Bright Flight and A Plus serve 21,351 students with $64.9 million, while $68.8 million serves the 43,845 students on need-based access and fast track. The non-need-based programs grant is approximately $3,038 per student, while need-based programs give $1,569 per student. Okay, thanks, this is a lot. Okay, um, given that data above, what easy opportunity can, um, can our department do to provide more scholarship dollars to those with greater need? And what impact could this have on our region? And do you believe there is room for collaboration between students, educators, and the Department of Higher Education Workforce Development to identify creative solutions. That's a lot. So, um, and hopefully you can see that in the chat too, I, in case I didn't say any of the numbers correctly. <laughs> yeah, I'm scrolling through the chat right now to make sure that I understand the essence of this question. So it's essentially what can a state with some merit-based programs and some need-based programs do to make sure that we're focusing what we have on students with need first? Mm -hmm. I think that's the essence, yes. Boom. Okay. So, um, a lot of states do have both types, not a lot, but okay. Maybe I won't put a quantity on it because I don't know off the top of my head, but I know Missouri is not the only state that has both, um, merit and need based programs kind of, um, in their suite of programs that they offer to students. Um, and this Mississippi actually stands out to me as one state that's done a good job on this one. Right. And so in Mississippi, they had two merit-based programs and one need-based program. And what their, um, their state aid agency has really been trying to do is to say, you know, the merit-based programs are there. Most constituents in the states want to see them stay there, right? Um, even, you know, and they've, they've hammered home the, um, the relative high income of the students receiving that group, that, that funding and the, the racial composition and the types of institutions those students attend. They've run that point home and like the fact of the matter is the programs, you know, they're there. The legislature has no appetite to get rid of them. They're going to be there. 
And one of the things that they've done is they've taken their need-based program and what they've advocated for is more flexibility within the state agency to allocate the funding between the programs. So rather than receiving from their legislature and their budget bill line items of here's what you get for, for the Missouri tuition aid grant or the Mississippi tuition aid grant, here's what you're gonna get for the Missouri Eminent Scholars Grant, and here's what you're gonna get for the need-based program, they've said, just give us one appropriation for all three, right? It's easier for you, it's easier for us, and then the state agency has the flexibility to allocate between the three programs. And since they've been doing this, what they've seen is that the need-based program, um, out, the, the, the share of those dollars going towards the need-based program as opposed to the merit-based program has increased. And so they're still meeting certainly the letter of the law when it comes to implementing the merit-based programs and making sure that students who qualify for that aid receive that aid. And they're also within their internal processes as an agency able to prioritize, here's what goes towards the need-based program. Um, and so certainly there are still, and I just wanna highlight this, there are still inequitable ways to award need-based aid. So having a need-based program or awarding your state financial aid dollars exclusively on need doesn't put you on the, the podium or the pedestal when it comes to having an equity driven state financial aid awarding environment, right? There are still really inequitable ways to award need based aid. And that includes things like early application deadlines. That includes things like requiring a FAFSA when we know that students without documented immigration status can't always fill one out or students in the foster care program would have a lot of issues filling it out. There's still inequitable ways to do that. So I wouldn't put need based aid on the pedestal as like this is the most equitable way to award aid. It certainly has a lot of promise and can make sure that that students can have um, more equal access and choice across post secondary institutions. Um, but it's not the only way to get there, if that makes sense. Um, and providing and one example of ways that states have gotten to that place of awarding need over merit is through increased flexibility at the regulatory level as opposed to through statute. So I hope that provides some little food for thought on that question. It does. And then the next question is also talking about need based data, but then it has a, another level of complexity to what states. To what extent do states with very large need programs, for example, California's program awards about $2 billion annually, how does that skew the national data? Yeah, that's a really good question, Leroy. Um, we, so when we were initially putting together those bar graphs, we wanted to do like a heat map by state so you could really kind of check out where, not just how much, but where are those programs. And it's tough to do with the um, with the data that are that are out there, and I won't go into the reasons why or anything like that. But Leroy is totally right. There could be a good bit of skew because there are eight states that award. I want to. It's over half of the the twelve billion dollars that states spend on aid every year. It's like California, Florida, Illinois, New York. Oh gosh, and then there's four more. And so there's always a little bit of skew when you look at that data nationally. So good point. Thank you for pointing that out, Leroy. Okay, the next question is, is there one thing you would point to in a certain state that has made a really big impact, something you think that all states should replicate? Oh, gosh, <laughs> I think there are very few policy ideas, and I don't even think this is just education policy, um, unique to education policy. States are all different. They're all, they have 50 different contexts in terms of their history and the students they're serving and the types of institutions they have and the legacies of those institutions. And so I would be, um, I think I would, I would be covering all of that nuance with too broad of a brush if I said all states should do this one thing. But gosh, I share the desire that I wish it were that simple, but then maybe I wouldn't have a job anymore. So that's a little bit tough for me too. I don't know. Um, you know, I think there may not be the same way to get there for all 50 states, but I think conversations like this conference today and like conversations that are happening in other venues and pockets within the state of Missouri to really take this equity lens to, to not just financial aid programs, but to all areas of post-secondary policy, I think really matters. Um, the way that that's implemented is going to look different across the 50 states, but I think that taking um, 
taking the time and the attention and the energy and the focus to really say, you know, gosh, let's examine the legacy of our programs, where they came from, what they're doing, are they accomplishing that? I think taking the time to ask those questions is really key and it's something I wish that all states would do. All right, I wanna squeeze in one more question because I also have this question. Um, <laughs> okay. Several of the principles call for robust data integration across departments to simplify student eligibility or measure impact. Um, are there lessons learned from states that are doing this really well? Um, and is there a role outside of government to do this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think that there's certainly a lot that, of course, I think there's a lot state policymakers can do with the principles, but I also think that they can apply at the institutional level or the system level. Um, I think that um, what states are learning when they do this is that as states have gone through, and we've done, you know, for several states, kind of like a, an audit, right? So based on these four principles, where would we kind of put your programs and what policy recommendations would we make? It's actually one of my funnest, one of my favorite things to do in my job. It's one of the things I've the most fun doing. Um, and the kinds of recommendations we make are usually things like focusing more on need or getting rid of deadlines. And the, the big, like capital P policy problem that we always come across is, is funding. There are generally always going to be more students that qualify if you restructure your programs to be student centered and timely and flexible and broadly inclusive. It increases even further the number of students that qualify for aid without providing more resources on on the other side. Um, and so the states that have done this, I think, um, have found that this is an issue. Um, and it's one I wish I had the answer to, but it's, you know, one that um, perhaps with the infusion of, of stimulus dollars that can be ameliorated across the states too, that would be great. Um, and I do think that there is a role outside of government. I think that um, institutions specifically, um, especially institutions that have stood to benefit for a long time from the infusion of merit-based resources, can pause perhaps on their, their advocacy for those programs and think more about, okay, well, we could actually still benefit a lot from a state-based merit, a need-based program as opposed to a merit-based program, right? Um, so getting institutions on board, I think really matters. And, um, you know, I, I guess I would still put state agencies within that state government bucket, but in a lot of states, they do have a good bit of latitude to, um, could be. to be awarding, um, in, in ways that may or may not, um, oh gosh, how do I want to say this? They do have latitude to set some of their own goals outside of what the legislature sets and more state agencies could take more advantage of that. I hope that's all right. Nice. Well, yeah, that, thank you so much. Um, we so much appreciate you coming and sharing mm -hmm. your insights with us today and um, had a lot of wonderful data to share with us. So we really appreciate you, you doing that. So, um, we better uh, get on to our next pieces of the summit. So um, the time is 9.43. So you have about seven minutes to take a quick break, grab some coffee or whatever your caffeinated beverage of choice is and join one of our fabulous breakout session presentations. Up next, we have two blocks of breakout sessions, um, which will run from 9.50 to 10.20. Um, and the second one will run from 10.30 to 11 o'clock. During each block, we will present three concurrent breakout sessions. You can access those sessions using the Edge Events Conference website, which I will put the link in the chat. And you're welcome to change sessions if you realize that there's one that you'd rather attend than another. And don't worry if you can't decide which one to pick because all of the presentations will be recorded and posted on our conference web landing website and on the Missouri Department of Higher Education website as well. So have a great uh, session and thank you again so much, Dr. Pingle.